prayers are flowing in a particular direction. So initially, Prahlad Maharaj says that, Oh my dear Lord, I offer obeisances to you. Please destroy the inauspiciousness in my heart. And then he says, Let there be, uh, be let all the things be pacified by the removal of the envy in their hearts. Then he says that, Actually, let my consciousness not be directed towards anyone except you. And if at all is directed anywhere else, let it be directed towards the association, towards devotees. And this verse focuses on how devotee association purifies us. It is a common theme in the Bhagavatam that actually hearing purifies us more than bathing in the holy places. And this is repeated over here. And Shri Prabhupada in the purport focuses on the substance of association is hearing. It is the spiritual sound vibration that is uh, transmitted and received in association. That is the engine of the spiritual transformation that association brings about. So we have been discussing about how God is a supreme therapist and he helps us heal us emotionally so that our emotions becoming healthy and pure are directed towards Krishna in a reciprocation of immortal love. And we discussed how first, in the first session I discussed how we have to recognize that emotional distress is a big distress in today's world. And in the second session I talked about how emotional distress, uh, people become very emotion, hypersensitive. And unless we are sensitive to people's sensibilities, we may alienate people. And yesterday I talked about how uh, the one alienating emotion can be uh, a misunderstanding about detachment. If it comes off as aversion, then that can alienate people. So bhakti has to be inclusive where we connect things of this world towards Krishna so that in a healthy way our emotions move towards Krishna. So today I will focus on that when we connect with Krishna through association and specifically through hearing, how does the transformation happen? Bhakti Yoga is basically the rechanneling of our emotional energy. The mind lies in, the, in between the soul and the body. And our emotions primarily flow through the mind. They, uh, they are triggered by the impressions on the mind and they flow thereby. So, currently our emotions flow to many things in this world. And we want the emotions to flow towards Krishna. And how does this happen? This happens primarily by the potency of spiritual sound vibration in association. How does association actually work? Uh, the, uh, yesterday I mentioned the essence of association is the transfer of desires. Uh, now there is a question that comes up. Is the, is the potency of bhakti automatic or is it to conscientiously to be tapped? That means that is it that just by coming in the association of devotees I will become purified? Or is it that in the association of devotees I have to strive to become purified. So actually, the ultimate requirement for us to love Krishna and to attain Krishna is that we use our freedom properly. And using our freedom properly is a conscientious process. It is not an automatic process. So I can say that I am already, if I am coming in the association of devotees, I am already using my free will. I could be in the association of non-devotees. But the fact that I am coming in the association of Krishna's devotees, those who are spiritually minded, those who are using their free will properly, that means I am already uh, using my free will properly. Yes, it is, but it is just the first installment of the proper use of free will. Because we act, we could say, with our hands, with our head, and with our heart. And when we do something with our hands, that means we just physically do it. With our head means we are intellectually involved in it. And with our heart means that our emotions are invested in it. 
they're deeply concerned about it. So for example, a surgeon, uh, uh, doctor, a surgeon, they have an assistant, and the surgeon will okay, pick this up, put this there, get back, get back. This is getting their hands, using their hands over there. They do not, the, the surgeon's assistant may not know much about what the surgery is being done. The surgeon has the head involved and also the hands, sorry, the hands involved and also the head. Okay, this is the, this is the part of the body that I have, the infection that I have to remove. And I'm going to cut like this. So if I cut like this, this blood will, this is going to get cut. The blood is going to come. We have to take care of that. So the, the head has to be involved. It's not just the hands. But the surgeon is not operating. Is not a machine operating on another machine. The person who is being operated, whose life and death, whose pain and uh, relief from pain are at stake, and the doctor should also have some amount of concern for the patient. So the heart also has to be involved. One of the major complaints where medicine has become more and more technology centered is that people feel that the doctors have become just too impersonal. And the doctor just do some diagnosis and the diagnosis is also not done so much by talking to the patient, but just have some standardized tests done. And they should have some so the patient's heart, the doctor does not involve the heart, and the patient doesn't feel much connected. And of course, doctors work in professional settings, and that's why they may not have the time or the inclination to invest themselves emotionally. But the point which I'm making over here is that <clears throat> bhakti is meant to channel both our hands, head and heart. That means our physically we are for Krishna service, intellectually we understand why I am acting in this way. And at the level of the heart, we invest our emotion in this direction. And all these three are ways in which we are using our free will. So coming to the temple is the first installment of the use of free will. The second installment is actually becoming attentive. Actually becoming trying to use our intelligence to understand what we are doing. What is the philosophy? How does it apply to my life? What am I meant to do? We use our intelligence. Like the Bhagavad Gita is so strong in recommending the use of intelligence that it says, Adishyate chalema dharmyam samvadam avayo jnana yadgena tenaha ishtasyamiti mehmati In 18.70 it says that those who are studying the sacred conversation of ours, Krishna is telling Arjuna, that those who are studying the sacred converse, conversation are actually worshipping me with their intelligence. So study is not just some intelligence, studying scripture or hearing scripture is not just some intellectual activity. It is actually a devotional activity. It's like when we do arati with a lamp, we can do arati and want to worship with the intelligence. So we want to use our intelligence properly. We, we direct our head. So if we don't do that, then uh, we may be physically in association, but we're not really using the free will properly. Or at least we're not using the we're not using the free will fully. And beyond that, there has to be also the uh, heart invested. Heart invested means there has to be the right attitude. I, I'm just hearing this. There might be a, a dry academic scholar also who may hear, who may learn about. Uh, we learn, study the scriptures and learn about Krishna. But then they will, if we don't invest the heart, then we will know about God. We won't know God. Knowing about God means we just get information about it. Just like a doctor may know a lot about a child who they treat. Okay, so WBC counters this, RBC counters this, platelet counters this, uh, the urine, urine has this, this thing. So you can have much more information about the child than the mother we have. But the doctor knows about the child, whereas the mother knows the child. So why? Because the mother's heart is invested over there. Similarly, in the process of bhakti, we have to invest not just our hands, not just our head, but also our heart. So, <clears throat> the process of bhakti uh, the question I, I talked about head, hand and hearts, hands, head and heart is that I was discussing the question that does the result of bhakti come automatically? 
scriptures talk so much about the importance of association about the potency of hearing about how hearing and association can be so dramatically transforming so will this happen automatically or does this have to be done conscientiously that's the question which i was discussing so actually nothing is automatic we are conscious beings it is not just by putting myself in association automatically i'm going yes some amount of growth will happen because the spiritual vibrations i'm placing myself in spiritual vibrations but the rapid growth will happen when i consciously strive to do it it's a, it's like a car if i get a car to go to a particular destination i can get there easily but just because it's easy doesn't mean that it's automatic still i have to navigate the traffic i have to drive the car properly similarly in association also we have to associate properly and we have to make sure that the desired result is happening just like if we are driving a car we are constantly looking okay i am going to get there that was 35 km miles away now it's 20 miles i am going in the right direction if i find earlier it was 35 miles away i have been driving for half an hour and still it's 35 miles away then something is wrong so similarly when we are in our spiritual journey towards krishna we could say association is like the vehicle association helps us it facilitates our journey towards krishna but it is for us to make sure that we grow to go towards krishna in association so here again the point comes that why would it happen if i am in association and i am not be going towards krishna that may happen if within association our emotional energy gets choked or it gets blocked or impeded in some way as i said our consciousness is meant to be offered to krishna our impure emotion of devotion is meant to be offered to krishna but if i come in the association of devotees and there is so much negativity in that association that my emotional energy gets caught in that negativity itself oh this devotee is like this this devotee is like that this is like this, this person did this to me that person did that to me then my emotions are caught and consumed in those in those dealings with the devotees alone and if those devotees the dealings are not very pleasant then my emotions take caught in the negativity and then although in the association i have the opportunity to offer my consciousness towards krishna to direct my emotions towards krishna it may not happen so if our emotions get blocked in the association then even in association we may not grow in fact the opposite may happen in the association we may start becoming averse to the association of devotees and we may start becoming uh, offensive which will actually not only slow down the process of progress of our emotions towards krishna we actually block it and even reverse it when we commit offenses in association the result is that krishna becomes displeased with us and krishna removes or withdraws the higher taste that we were getting in bhakti and once we stop getting that higher taste then again our lower taste that were in the past they start surfacing again and we feel drag towards the worldly enjoyments that we were indulging in in the past of course krishna is merciful and even if we indulge in those worldly pleasures we won't get any significant pleasure because we've got a higher taste but still the channel towards krishna of our emotions and the channel towards sense objects for our emotions the if we want the surface to be like this so that it naturally flows towards krishna and doesn't flow towards the sense objects but if we become offensive then the surface becomes like this so that Our emotions naturally flow towards the sense objects, and our emotions flowing towards Krishna becomes more and more difficult. So, in association, we have to keep the purpose in mind. The purpose is, I have come in association to develop my love for Krishna, to channel my emotional energy towards Krishna. And if that is not happening, then making it happen is my responsibility. 
So association can provide magical results, but getting that results is my getting those results is my responsibility. That means even in association, you know, whose association, which kind of association, it helps me channel my emotions towards the child, which accelerates this flow, which decelerates the flow, and. Uh, what exactly is happening with respect to my consciousness at large? It is for me to observe that. And if in certain association, if we just feel so, so inhibited, so agitated, so choked, that we can't practice bhakti, then we may have to create some safe distance and associate with those who inspire us in the practice of bhakti. The, if we consider that, why is it the, prop, the comparison is given in the Bhagavatam that the Kanga purifies, but association purifies faster. So why is it, what, what is it that makes association so special? Ganga is also a great devotee of the Lord. And we are also coming in contact with the Ganges when we bathe in her sacred waters. And there are devotees, uh, we could say that the devotees around us may not be that great also. So, if we see, the point is that the bathing in the Ganges is pure. Ganges is pure and it may purify us. It may cleanse us of certain, uh, certain sinful reactions. But at the same time, it is the sinful desires that is the problem. And our desires change by associating with those whose desires have changed. Our desires change by associating with those who have changed desires. If somebody is alcoholic and they want to give up alcohol, if they start associating with, keep associating with alcoholics, they will never get the, even if they get some inspiration, I want to give up alcohol, they will not be able to give up their alcohol. Now suppose they decide to give up their alcohol and then if they associate with people who have always been sober, they can feel okay. I want to become like that. But the distance between them may appear too much. No, these people don't understand any of the struggles that I'm going through. Yes, I, I want to become like them, but how do I become like them? So that's why there is often the association of recovering alcoholics with something like Alcoholics Anonymous. And these Alcoholics Anonymous, in, the, in such an association, they just, they don't have simply sober people. They also have people who are at, are at different levels of recovery. And having, meeting people and interacting with them, okay, how did you, how did you overcome this temptation? Even now when you get tempted, how do you deal with it? You know, how do you, more important, is how do you, how do you create a purposeful, meaningful life which will help us when we to get rid of the urge for alcohol? They discuss all this. And that's how, for them, the process of becoming free from the addiction becomes real. So, so I've given this example of Alcoholics Anonymous to illustrate that point. That sometimes we may become too judgmental about our association. I said earlier that even in association, we have to discern is this association taking my emotions towards Krishna? Uh, so, but then you may say, oh, the devotees around me, they are all new fight. That, you know, if only I had the association of pure devotees, that would be so inspiring for me. Yes, association of exalted devotees is inspiring. But sometimes the distance between them and us will be so great that the inspiration primarily stays at the level of admiration. It doesn't create the urge for transformation. Yes, you are so great and I want to serve you. What can I do for you? But as far as becoming like you, that's a project for the next life. <laughs> so, just the association of very exalted devotees, it can be inspiring, it can, uh, but whether it alone will inspire us to transform ourselves. That it may give us the conviction as yes, spiritually advanced states are for real and we can get to those states. And I, yes, there are people at that stage. 
But whether I can get to that state or not, that conviction may not come simply by association of exalted devotees. That's why we need association of equals also. People who are struggling with their condition like we are. And in this struggle, when we are dealing with us, uh, when we are dealing with others also who have anathas like us, we have to associate with the positive side of others, not the negative side. Just like as a recovering alcoholic, if I have sometimes the urge to relapse and sometimes the, the will to stay strong and become free, so do others. Now, if I associate with someone during their weak moments and they are thinking of relapsing and I go with them and relapse, then I'm not fulfilling the purpose of their association. In their weak moments, I should be helping them. And in my weak moments, I sh uh, somebody should be helping me. So that means that even in an association of people who are trying to become sober, not all association will be equally beneficial at all time. So if somebody is having a weak moment, they need to go and talk with someone who is strong at that time. Of course, uh, that person who is strong at that time may also later have a weak moment. It's like a war going on. In this war, we are all fighting. And sometimes the enemy bullet may hit one person. And sometimes the enemy bullet may hit another person. So who is wounded, the person has to be lifted. Uh, the comrades have to lift that person and help them. But two wounded people may not be of much help to each other. They may commiserate in their pain, but beyond that, what else? They will not be able to move towards safety or move towards any constructive action. So now with respect to alcohol, it is easy to understand. You know, I came here to give up alcohol, and somehow this person is drinking, okay, I cannot associate. So getting the urge to drink, and I also, then I have, I'm also getting that urge. So let me go and associate with someone who is free from that urge and who will help me to become free. But if I, because alcohol, drinking alcohol is such a physical activity, physically visible activity, so it's easy to understand that my purpose is not being served here. But in the association of devotees, also devotees have their weak moments. And not just their weak moments, devotees also have their lower side, which they are trying to work. So somebody may have uh, weakness in lust, somebody may have lust, weakness in pride, somebody may have weakness in anger. And these movements, uh, these, these lower tendencies are there, and they sometimes become very strong. So when somebody becomes angry at us and starts shouting at us, if at that time I start thinking, if devotees are like this, what is the point of being with devotees? Uh, devotees, ideally speaking, we should not get angry and certainly we should not shout at others, yell at others, speak hurtfully to others. But everyone has their conditionings. So if because of someone's conditionings, they start, uh, they, they at that time are, have become puppets of anger and they are shouting at us. And we think, are devotees like this? Should I be associating with devotees? Well, yes, we should be associating with devotees. And are devotees like this? Well, no, not all devotees are like this all the time. But some devotees may be like this sometime. And at that time, it is for me to recognize that I need some other association. So if we equate the whole association of devotees with the improper conduct of one or two or a few devotees, then we miss out on the potency of the association of devotees. But at the same time, if we don't distance ourselves at that time, some devotees are very pessimistic, very critical. In any group they come, they start finding faults. This is not right, this is not right, this is not right. And if we associate with them, we will become filled with so much negativity. Oh, this person is not doing this right, this person is not doing this right, this person is not doing this right. And among the various anathas, this critical mentality is actually, in one way, the most dangerous. Because when we say when we start getting lust or greed or envy, at that time 
we understand that actually this is a weakness within me which is infecting me right now. This is a lower bully that has come in. So normally, if, if such a lower desire starts pulling us, it creates humility. Krishna and me, you have so fallen. But the critical mentality does not create humility. It creates superiority, a sense of superiority. Oh, they are not doing it right, they are not doing it right, they are not doing it right. I know what is right. So now some devotees who are in authoritative positions may have to set some standards. And for that, they may sometimes have to point out the faults. But even they need to look for the good in others. If Shri Prabhupada's focus had been on finding faults, then the hippies were, we could say, personified on Kalira, Kalir Dosho Nidheraj. They are an ocean of faults. But Prabhupada did not look at the ocean of faults. Prabhupada looked at the island of, island of good. What is a small island of good in this vast ocean of faults? That small island is they want to know about Krishna. They have a spiritual spark within them. And Prabhupada focused on finding that. So uh, sometimes uh, finding out faults may be a service, but it has to be done conscientiously and cautiously so that we don't discourage others through the fault finding. But if some devotees are like that, always critical, then we have to see that this association is going to be infected. Although it is the devotee, maybe even speaking about devotion, but they are not exactly speaking in a way that it increase my devotional desire. That will not help me channel my emotions towards Krishna. So sometimes some devotees may speak strongly at us, that's simply their conditioning coming up. And sometimes they may speak strongly because to us because we are doing something wrong and we need to be corrected. If it's the first case, just then, it's very difficult to judge whether it is their conditioning which is making them angry or it is our conditioning which is making us faulty, which is making them angry. Whether their anger is valid or invalid, it is very difficult to decide. At least at that moment. So, it's good to just stay humble and move out of that situation. Because it's very difficult to, if somebody is uh, angry, it's very, very difficult to rationally respond at that time. And whether they can also take a rational response, that also is difficult. So then, we create a distance and then we try to pray and come to the word of goodness and then analyze company. And then decide what to do. The important thing is, we have to make sure that our consciousness keeps moving towards Krishna. And I'll conclude with one point that in the association of devotees, different devotees can inspire our consciousness to move towards Krishna in different ways. Some devotees may lead us towards Krishna and some devotees may kick us towards Krishna. <laughs> that means some devotees with their sweetness, kindness, uh, helpfulness, they help us. It's like a parent taking a child by the hand towards Krishna. They just say, oh, devotees are so nice, I have always been Krishna conscious. But some devotees, maybe it's their conditioning, our conditioning, a combination of both, they deal with us so harshly. Hey, what is going on? If you say that, ultimately our shelter is Krishna. And these devotees, by making me, by dealing with me like this, what is happening? So they are reminding me that my ultimate shelter has to be Krishna. So let me take shelter of Krishna more and more. When we have this attitude that you know, my, it is making sure that my consciousness flowing towards Krishna is my responsibility, then we will be able to act wisely, act judiciously in an association. And whatever be the particular association, we will find the way to take our consciousness towards Krishna. When the association leads us forward, anukulya sa sankalpa. That when somebody is leading us by the hand, we will happily accept that association and move forwards. And somebody kicks us by their harsh feelings. We say, pratikulya sa vajan. Okay, I keep a distance, but I will not let this devotee's actions make, come between me and Krishna. Some devotees can lead me towards Krishna. Some devotees, sometimes unwittingly, by their actions, may tend to push away from Krishna. But rather than letting them push us away from Krishna, we see that this, is, that this action is not because of their Krishna consciousness. That this action 
is because of their lack of Christian consciousness. And we don't want to become judgmental towards them. We also sometimes, or many times, act without Christian consciousness. But when somebody acts without Christian consciousness, we don't equate their behavior with the behavior of devotees in general. Or we don't equate that with Krishna Bhakti at large. You see, this is because of their lack of Krishna consciousness. Even if I have some mistake, maybe this was not the way the mistake should be pointed out. But if they done it like that, I don't let that devotee's behavior come between me and Krishna. I say, this is what I would never want to become weak. And therefore, this devotee is acting this way because presently they are lacking in Krishna consciousness. If I don't want to act like that, then let me become more Krishna conscious. So, if we have that attitude, then both the positive, so sometimes in the alcoholic society, somebody is relapsing. Somebody relapses, you know, I don't want to go on that path. Let me be very cautious. Let me, let me focus on the positivity and become more determined about that. And somebody who is determined in moving forwards, in recovery, we get inspiration even from that. So if our determination to serve Krishna is strong, then even if the devotee association sometimes works favorably and sometimes unfavorably, both we will be able to take as inputs for increasing our connection with Krishna, for intensifying the flow of our consciousness towards Krishna. So I'll summarize. I spoke today about how <clears throat> the association of devotees works magically in transforming us, but making it work is our responsibility. So, this verse talks about how association and hearing and association transforms. And I was talking about the, how we have to be, we have to ensure that we channel our emotional energy properly in association. And I started by talking about what essentially association is a transfer of desires. Is this transformation in association, the change of desires from material to spiritual. Is this automatic or does it have to be conscientiously done? And the answer is it has to be conscientiously done because the essence of bhakti is the proper use of free will. And proper use of free will is something every one of us has to do on our own. So, <clears throat> it's like if I have a car, I have to drive the car properly to get to its station. So the association will be good like a facility which makes it easier for me to go towards Krishna. But still, I have the responsibility. So using our feet properly means use aligning our hands, our head and our heart with our purpose. So like a surgeon's assistant, a surgeon who is just, uh, just business-like and a surgeon who is actually caring. So similarly for us, we want to engage physically. So just coming in the association of devotees and the first installment of the right use of free will. Uh, wherein physically I place myself right. But secondly is, I have to use my intelligence to understand bhakti wisdom. That's the second installment of the writing of the The head. The third is, I have to actually put my heart in the process of bhakti, invest my emotions. And then we will move towards Krishna. If in the association of devotees, because of differences, our emotions get choked in the animosity in that, in that association, then association may not be taking us towards Krishna. So, and she, by keeping in mind the purpose that my emotional energy is meant to go towards Krishna, we have to choose the association that will help us to move towards Krishna. So, very advanced devotees, by their purity, by their maturity, by their spiritual potency, can trigger that, can, that spiritual desires within us and make us want to grow towards Krishna. But that doesn't mean that devotees are equal, they are of no importance. Like a person recovering from alcohol, a sober person may be a model of how I want to become, but it may be too, seem, to be too, seem too far away. So recovering alcoholics can be better A's on the journey. Similarly, sadhakas who are also struggling with their condition like us can help us in uh, our journey by understanding where we are and by helping us move along. So all of us, because we have, we have strengths and weaknesses, sometimes we have our moments. So if we associate with, if alcoholic, if alcoholic associates with another alcoholic while they are weak, then they will relax. So when people have their weak moments, at that time, we have to keep 
a distance from them. Or they have the lower side, which makes them behave particularly, and we keep a distance from them. And by keeping the purpose in mind, we associate with those devotees in a way, with, with devotees in a way that ensures that our emotional energy is moving towards Krishna. If some devotee be, uh, was very harshly with us, we don't uh, equate that with uh, the, this is how devotees are, but rather, this is how I don't want to be. And they are acting like this because of lack of Krishna consciousness. So let me try to become more Krishna conscious. Some devotees may lead us towards Krishna by their loving nature, and somebody may kick us towards, some devotees may kick us towards Krishna by their harsh acting. Now, when somebody becomes angry at us, whether it is because of their conditioning, or our conditioning, or the friction of both conditionings, it's difficult to know. And we need to just maybe retreat from there and come to the mode of goodness by which you can evaluate, analyze. But more importantly, we have to make sure that our enthusiasm for moving towards Krishna continues. So when, uh, the, uh, if everybody has their, has their conditioning, then we don't want to get their conditioning by associating with them. So among various conditionings, the, say last anger, it is relatively easy to detect, but a critical mentality it makes us feel proud, not humble. And that's why it can be a very dangerous way in which we, st we stay in association, but we get none of the benefits of association. Because we're just looking at faults. So, if we make sure that we associate with those devotees who inspire us to direct our emotional energy towards Krishna, we take that responsibility for ensuring that our, emotion, our consciousness moves towards Krishna. Then, in the association of devotees, Krishna will guide us to the right association and in the right way by which we will experience this magical transformation of the heart being redirected from the world towards Krishna. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Are there any comments or questions? Thank you. Um, so, you know, there's just I'm trying to understand about you know, if you, it seems like it's a catch 22 or a situation which um, I mean, really is a downward spiral. Like if, you're, if, you, if you said that if you commit offenses, then you know, then the slope is there so that it increases the material, the pulling of the material desires. And um, of course, material desires also increase the uh, tendency to be offensive. So, if material desires increase the offensive propensity and then uh, offensive propensity increases material desires, then how does one get out of the, that vicious cycle where they're, hmm. they're, they're suffering from the reaction to their offenses and then that reaction itself also makes them more offensive? Yeah. So, if we make offenses, then increase our material desires. And the material desires make us become more offensive. So then this just becomes a vicious cycle. How do we break free from it? Yes, generally, it's like a circle. Once it has begun, it's drawn a circle. Once the circle is drawn, it's very difficult to know from where it was drawn. So where something starts is very difficult to know. But what we can do is we can break it wherever we can. That means if I find myself becoming very, very offensive in the association of some devotees, then let me associate with somebody else and those association I don't become so offensive. Let me associate with those who can help me to see the positive in those devotees. By which I can stay positive and purposeful. And if I find a particular artha is just growing too much, then okay, can I control this? What do I need to do to uh, control myself in this situation? Maybe I have to change it, I have to create some obstacles between me, some protective guards, guarding things between me and that indulgence so that I can be protected. Whatever it is, it is, so just like where a circle begins, we can't go. If my hand is going round and round and round and make a circle, where should I stop it? Wherever I can. So in a vicious cycle, where do we break it? Break it wherever we can. So sometimes, some devotees, we may just have so much negativity because of whatever they have done. Stopping that may be very difficult. Then just move to some other association or get somebody else's association. So, yena kena prakarena mana krishna nishati. Somehow or the other, fix the mind of Krishna. So, what works when is something which is very difficult to see. 
but if in our if in our more sober saner moments we recognize that we may have committed some offenses then it is good to uh, seek forgiveness and try to make some amends that also krishna appreciates very much and more importantly it's not that we are most importantly is that we don't have to live paranoid oh i may commit offense i may commit offense we have to we have we don't have to be offense conscious we have to be krishna conscious if we are krishna conscious naturally we will be able to avoid offenses there is one devotee who was telling me that actually i commit many offenses that's why i decided never to go and associate with devotees then i not commit any offenses <laughs> this is like saying that now when i take this when i go to this when i take this medicine in this hospital it causes some side effects therefore i will not go to the hospital only well then you are going to stay sick or it's like say when i eat the, when i when i ate a particular food it caused a uh, disturbance of it upset my stomach therefore i stop eating food stopping eating the food means we will become weak and die so we need association for nourishing ourselves so it's not an association is a problem particular interaction or a particular devotee particular uh, association a particular frame may be a problem so then we have to associate with others in a different frame and move on towards krishna Yes, Vishantra. So normally we see that uh, association is seen as uh, between an advanced devotee giving knowledge to some younger devotees. Uh, so is it that the association of equals also helps in advancement? Yes, it depends on whether the equals have a similar purpose. The point here is that if there are patients and there is a doctor, the doctor is the most important person in the treatment without the doctor the treatment will not work so we all need advanced spiritual devotees for us like prabhupad and as spiritual masters they are vital so we need advanced devotees but at the same time if we expand this metaphor a little bit more it is not just if it's a big hospital it's not just one doctor who is doing everything the team of doctors and they're all working together the bhagavad gita uh, in 4.34 the verse which we quote most often tadvidhi pranipadena pariprashena sevaya upadekshante te gyanam gyanam sattva darshinah actually if we see tattva darshinah it's not tattva darshi it's not singular it's plural it's uh, krishna is saying arjuna go to the self realized souls and hear from them those who go to the seers of truth that means that actually we we hear from different people if you look at the mahabharat the ramayan lord ram when in the forest he is not thinking oh i'll only hear from valmiki or oh, from vashishta vashishta in ayodhya when in the forest he is hearing from different sages over there pandavas also in the forest hear from many different sages so it is that the spiritual master is vital so if you consider like a another example i'll come back to the hospital an example later but uh, if you consider university the spiritual master is like the dean of the university or the head of the department whose signature ensures that we get admitted into the university 
and they might be the best professor in the best uh, faculty over there. But if our particular research specialization is somewhat different, if, some, if I say I'm getting into college for PhD, I need the team's approval. But then my PhD guy may be somewhat different. And nowadays most PhDs are very interdisciplinary. So I have this, this person, this person, this person. And then the whole, system, the whole you could say the whole education of PhDs is, is, is under the supervision of the PhD guy. But the, uh, under the under the dean, but then may various different guys who may help that person in different subjects. So the purpose of education is common, but that purpose is not fulfilled only through one person. It is through many different people. Similarly, in a hospital where there are where a patient has a complicated case with many different diseases, sometimes there will be different specialist doctors also who may work together. So. Krishna is infinite and all of us, even beyond devotees, nobody can perceive Krishna fully. So, say, I'm looking at Krishna in this way. You are looking at Krishna in this way. Somebody looking at Krishna in this way. So now, our, it is, not only is our perception of Krishna finite, but even that finite perception is distorted. We will always pursue Krishna finite, but as long as there are impurities there, even that finite perception will be distorted. A pure devotee's perception of Krishna is clear. It's not. It's undistorted. But that doesn't mean a pure devotee's perception of Krishna is infinite. Pure devotee is also finite. Their, their speciality is their purity. It's not that they become God. So that's why uh, sometimes even exalted devotees, they will be perceiving Krishna from a particular way. And that may connect with us sometimes. And somebody else perceiving Krishna from a different direction, they may connect more with us. Because the connection with Krishna ultimately is spiritual. But the means to that connection can is actually through our consciousness currently is filtered through our intellect, through our mind, through our culture through the society that we live in. There are so many ways that cause the distortion, uh, cause the filtering of it, not necessarily distortion. So Srila Prabhupada wanted everyone to read his books. At the same time, even in the early stages of the movement, he wanted devotees to give classes. He did not want just his recordings to be given. One reason, of course, just by speaking, we realization more. But also by speaking, say, if it's almost everywhere. Say if somebody is and somebody is from a particular culture, and then some some spiritual practitioner from their culture starts explaining it, everything becomes more intelligible. If somebody from another culture comes, it's it's more of a curiosity. Hey, what is all this? I want to know about it. But how does it apply in my life? Somebody who understands the way I live, the way I think, that's what will help me to understand. So, for us, uh, we, different devotees may be perceiving Krishna in different ways. And if they're, the more purer they are, the, the, the more accurate their perception is. But accuracy doesn't mean uh, Krishna is exhausted. Nobody has complete perception of Krishna. So sometimes, that's why Prabhupada also says, study scriptures, scrutinize them. Study, that means, study from different angles of view, different perspectives. So different devotees may give us understanding from different directions different perspectives. And that can help us to grow. So even if a student, sometimes the professor speaks something and one student doesn't get it, the other student gets it. And going to the professor may not give the clarification. But asking another student, they both, both speak the same language, both at the same level, it's like, oh, I got it. So it's a process of learning. So going back to the hospital metaphor, you know, somebody who has gone through the treatment and they say, oh, yes, you do this, during, when you take this injection, you get a lot of, you get a lot of uh, queasy sensation. You feel like uh, you're becoming sick, throwing up or whatever. But it doesn't stay for long. It's tolerated. So if somebody is going through that, tells us, okay, it becomes easier. So I'd say that the learning or healing is a, it's a humility process. And we get inputs from various directions. So as long as these different directions, uh, these different inputs don't 
confuse us about which direction I'm supposed to. As long as our direction is clear, or the purpose is clear, we, we are meant to learn from different people. The spiritual world is also society. It's not that we will be there with our spiritual master alone. It's, it's a community over there. So we are meant to live in a community and we learn and we share. That's why we have Diksha Guru and we have Shiksha Gurus. So we have to check whether the purpose is being served or not. Now as far as scripture not talking about so much about his horizontal interactions, my understanding for, about that is that the Bhagavatam and the Bhagavad Gita are spoken at a particular time in history. And that is a time when a person urgently needed spiritual knowledge. So Parishma is about to die and Arjuna had to decide whether I'm going to fight or not. So at that time, by circumstantial necessity, the transmission knowledge was vertical. It was thrown up. But then we have the six Goswamis. They described that they would just sit together and discuss. They, they would just sit and, and it's not that, okay, Rupa and Sanatana were senior, but ultimately they all interacted with each other. And Rupa and Sanatana were discussing with each other. So there is there are examples of devotees discussing Krishna Katha among each other also. And that is a nourishing in its own way. So it's, in fact, if you see, 4.34 is one verse where the transmission is described as vertical. But the real rasa of bhakti, where how do devotees reach bhakti is described in 10.9. That is not vertical. Bodhayantaha parasparam. Machitta mankata prana bodhayantaha parasparam. Kathayanta shamanityam tushanti charamanity charam. That the devotees, they, their hearts are fixed on me, they, their lives are devoted to me, and they delight in enlightening each other about me. So Prabhupada writes, in the devote, uh, in one lecture he says, that here Krishna is already talking about enlightened people, isn't it? Previous one, this is 10.9, 10.8 said that, Aham sarva sepra matta sarva pravartate, iti matva vajanti maam buddha bhava samanvita. That they are already enlightened, they are already buddha. If they are buddha, then how can you have, how are they doing bodha yanta? If they are already enlightened, then how are they enlightening each other? That is because Prabhupada says Krishna is unlimited. And different devotees perceive Krishna from different directions and they enlighten, oh Krishna is this is like this, this is like this. That's how the enlightenment in bhakti is not a state to be attained. It, it is a, it is a emotion to be savored eternally. Because it's not just a destination that we get. It's more of a, more of an emotion we relish continuously. So in that sense, the equal association is also talked about and that is considered to be extremely tasteful, extremely relishable. Okay. So thank you very much. Do we have time? Okay, one last question. Can you speak? I'll repeat the question. So sometimes some devotees may become resentful within an institution because they feel that we have to put up a particular image and conform to certain uh, doctrines or practices which prevent them from expressing their individuality or being who they are. In this, there is always a tension between uh, the individual needs and the institutional needs. The institution by default requires some amount of standardization. There is some commonality which defines the institution. But individuals are unique in their own ways. So broadly speaking, uh, the principle is that the individuals have to be ready to conform in some, some aspects. 
and the institution needs to be ready to give room for individuality in some aspects. Now specifically, which aspects for, require conformity and which aspects uh, will allow for individuality, that will vary from situation to situation, in both the, both the individual and the institution. Now by Shri Prabhupada's uh, vision, he did not make this con into a monolithic organization. Monolithic means that it's not that there is one central bureaucracy which administers everything. So each temple is like a nuclear family. And each temple has its leader and they have their vision. And that's why each temple, if we go to, they have their own moves. And we can always find out uh, if, if we feel that a particular place mood doesn't match with us, we can always go somewhere else. Of course, we can't just keep giving, going from one place to another. Because the role, as we said, the mind will never be satisfied with it. The mind will always find faults. Even if we go to paradise, the mind will say, yes, but... <laughs> and the mind will continue its rant of complaints. So, the point is, uh, there are different places where individual needs may be catered to in different ways. So, in the problem comes because we don't clarify expectations. Generally, in an institution, we won't get two things together. Freedom and facility. If there is a particular facility, okay, this, 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 this facility is there, then if those who are the leaders of that particular institution or that particular place, they will have a vision of how that facility is meant to be used. And they have been, they have done some service, they have been responsible enough. And that's how they have got the, the place where they have been entrusted with the responsibility to take care of the facility. So, uh, if I want to use that facility, then I have to uh, more or less harmonize with their vision. But, if, if I have some strong inspiration to do something in a particular way, it's not that we are stopped from that. We have the freedom to do it. But then, we, the problem comes when we want freedom and we want facility. That is not going to work. So if we want facility, then we have to some extent conform. If we want freedom, then we shouldn't expect the facility. Then we have to take the initiative ourselves. And if we have a strong zeal to serve Krishna, Krishna will reciprocate and eventually the facility will also come. But instead of, we want the freedom and we want the facility and we don't get that, we just become resentful. So facilities in this world are limited. And everybody has their freedom, everybody has their inspiration, their vision. So those who are leaders, they use the facility that they have accordingly. In general, if we are trying to serve Krishna, nobody is going to bind our hands and legs and tell don't serve Krishna. Even if it's in a new way. All that they may say that yes, we don't have the resources right now to help you in this. If you want to do it, you do it. So, generally, if the individual needs are particularly strong and the institutional situation is not fulfilling that need, then the individual, it's better not to become resentful, but to find out, okay, how can my need be fulfilled? Either I generate the facility or I connect with somebody who can provide me the facility. And then I move on. Does that answer the question? Yes. Thank you very much. Gantra Shrimad Bhagavatam ki, Shila Prabhupada ki, Gaurabhakta Vrindaki jai.